I am getting increasingly suspicious of the very idea of the internet <laughs> and, and the consequences that it has for public conversation, for public debate, for foreign policy. There is a long history of utopian thought uh, where technology plays a key role. Uh, you can go centuries back uh, in history and see that later uh, we had lots of thinkers in America and France who thought that technology can fundamentally transform how we live and how societies function. And they saw that technology can solve a lot of uh, social and political problems that were unsolvable at the time. Whether it's surveillance or censorship or propaganda, those elements are traditionally uh, disregarded by cyber utopians. But also, I think, in generally in cyber utopian thought, uh, you see a lot of fascination with what the internet can accomplish, whether it's bring down authoritarianism, whether it's to promote democracy, whether it's to solve all the problems connected to education in Africa or poverty. Very often, such projects uh, distract our attention and resources from probably more realistic, but also more effective ways to pursue social and political change. And when it comes to the internet specifically, I think utopianism distracts us from paying closer attention to the main players, whether it's the governments, whether it's the companies, whether it's users, whether it's all sorts of non-state actors. We have to be a little bit more realistic and not treat Google and Facebook as just the corporate equivalent of Human Rights Watch, or the corporate equivalent of Amnesty International. I mean, they do contribute a lot to the good to the world, but they also have their own business agendas, and very often their interests diverge from the interests of democracies, from the interests of citizens. And my fear is that in all of this enthusiastic utopian rhetoric, about the liberating power of cyberspace, we are not paying enough attention to ways in which such freedoms are being eroded. Uh, again, why not spend the amount of effort and money Western governments spend on, West, on training bloggers in Iran or Egypt? Why not spend that effort on blocking Western technology firms from selling surveillance equipment to the governments of Iran or Syria or Libya or Egypt or Russia or China? If we, as a society, come to a democratic decision by following democratic means, that we need to tweak a few internet protocols and make it less open, great. You know, that's, you accept to, that's what you accept, you know, by living in a democracy. Movements like Anonymous and LulzSec, uh, since they bear such little uh, connection to the real world for obvious reasons, they do view the internet as some kind of a sacred cow, as this new space that is holy and that needs to be defended. So what have the leaderless movements achieved in Egypt, for example? Yes, they managed to overthrow the Egyptian government. Have they been able to act as effectively without a leader in a decentralized manner uh, in participating in Egyptian politics? No. They have been outsmarted by existing groups with hierarchies, with control, with clear leaders. I'm all for having elite models when it comes to activism. I think the idea that everything goes and that every campaign is good as any other campaign as long as it gets enough page views, no, I think this view is ridiculous. I think there are certain values and benefits that accrue with expertise. You know, and you can say that, hey, all we need to do is to arrest Joseph Kony and then sign my petition, get me 50,000 views, and I have no idea about Africa. I have not, I know nothing about Joseph Kony. I know nothing about the history of the Civil War, but, you know, it's trendy and it's emotional. So should I trust that campaign, or should I trust someone who actually knows something about the region, who has spent time thinking about it, and who knows that maybe going after Joseph Kony at this point will be counterproductive. What I expect people to do after reading my book and reading some of my writings and critiques of digital activism is to uh, understand that, hey, maybe it's worth listening to experts, maybe it's worth building some complexity in our campaign, maybe it's worth setting a target that is not extremely ambitious and that may result in less media attention that will actually accomplish things. And maybe it's worth understanding the psychology of our participants and to understand that, hey, Maybe the only reason why people get involved in our Facebook campaign is because they want to impress their friends. Right? There is nothing wrong with that. We can accept that as the driving feature of campaigns and then see how we can work around it. Maybe we can build our campaign in a way that will make people work harder or will make them do things before they just disengage or will make sure that to join the group they actually have to pay. 
right? And that will uh, filter a lot of people who are there just doing nothing. I think also that participants to those campaigns can grasp that, well, maybe they shouldn't be joining 50,000 groups and just join 50, or just join five, or just join one, and focus on that particular group. You have to understand that a lot of online activism, as is practiced now, is ineffective. And maybe you'll be better off investing your time, resources, and money in something else. Each successful act of online activism uh, also triggers effects on the general political culture where it takes place. And we need to understand what those effects are because very often those effects will actually outweigh whatever benefits we gain uh, through a particular mobilization campaign.